I was sitting at my computer compiling some home videos of my son when an interesting thought occurred to me. How should I raise a son in this bizarre world of ours? With all the insanity around us, what was a father to do? As I continued to view all of the video, I realized a story was developing and furiously started writing. What developed was quite astonishing. This is my son Mason. He came into this world free, free to live his own life how he chooses, to think as he chooses, and to speak as he chooses, without fear of retribution from any man or any government. The journey I took over the last six years parallels another journey that started with the birth of my son. This is the story of our journey together. On January 24, 2007, I held my son Mason in my arms for the very first time. We stared into each other's eyes, amazed at what we saw. From day one, I watched him grow and protected him from our decaying society, its processed foods and pharmaceuticals, and the vaccinations from those same pharmaceutical companies. I stood guard over him, protected him from our out-of-control government, and taught him to think for himself. I was born in Atlantic City, New Jersey, the eighth of ten children of good Scotch-Irish parents. How they managed all of us, I couldn't tell you. We were a laughing bunch of hooligans, as my mother used to call us, and we enjoyed the cocoon of a world that resembled a Walt Disney animated feature. Safe and secure in our illusionary world, we were sheltered by my parents from all of the tragedies of the 60s and the 70s. The assassinations of JFK. This is rare footage my father took of John Kennedy's funeral from our television. Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy and many other events from that era. That's me in 1965. I miss those times. I miss my childhood. But not the polyester suit. I miss the laughter, the food, and the camaraderie of my big brothers. They all have families of their own now, a total of 32 nieces and nephews. I almost know all of their names. I grew up, had children of my own, my lovely daughter Casey, and my son, Mason. I raised them with fun and laughter, learning and compassion, all the while teaching them the truth of the world around them. I showed them what was going on and interacted with them daily. 
We very rarely watched TV and mostly played a lot of music. But after 9-11, I became very concerned about the state of our country, our irresponsible leaders, our out-of-control government, our lying representatives, the manipulative media, the illegal wars, the pharmaceutical drug pushers, and our failing economy. In the summer of 2007, I was changing channels on the TV and saw a remarkable phenomenon. The Republican debates were in progress and all the Republican politicians I couldn't stand were present. I was a Republican, mind you, but because of all the lies, deceit, illegal wars, and the stripping of our constitutional rights of the Bush-Clinton-Bush years, I simply could not stomach this bunch of phonies. I was about to turn it off when I heard a soft-spoken, intelligent voice speak out against our abhorrent foreign policy. I focused in, amazed and literally flabbergasted by the honest and straightforward answers of a humble and thoughtful man, Dr. Ronald Ernest Paul. Iraqis who have staked their lives in backing the U.S. and would you leave troops in the region to take out any Al Qaeda camps that are developed after we leave? The people who say there will be a bloodbath are the ones who said it would be a cakewalk, it would be a slam dunk, and that it would be paid for by oil. Why believe them? They've been wrong on everything they've said. So why not ask the people, why not ask the people who advise not to go in into the region and into the war? The war has not gone well one bit. Yes, I would leave, uh, I would leave completely. Why leave the troops in the region? It was the fact that we had troops in Saudi Arabia was the re one of the three reasons given for the attack on 9-11. So why leave them in the region? They don't want our troops on the Arabian Peninsula. We have no need for our national security to have troops on the Arabian Peninsula. And going into Iraq and Afghanistan and threatening Iran is the worst thing we can do for our national security. I am less safe. The American people are less safe for this. It's the policy that is wrong. Tactical movements and shifting troops around and taking in 30 more and reducing by five, totally irrelevant. We need a new foreign policy that said we ought to mind our own business, bring our troops home, defend this country, defend our borders. So, so, so if... NBC makes a splendid straw man argument when they pose the question. So Congressman Paul, and I'd like you to take 30 seconds to answer this. You're basically saying that we should take our marching orders from Al Qaeda. If they want us off the Arabian Peninsula, we should leave. No. I'm saying, I'm saying we should take our marching orders from our constitution. We should not go to war. We should not go to war without a declaration. We should not go to war when it's an aggressive war. This is an aggressive invasion. We've committed the invasion of this war. I cheered when Dr. Paul slammed their childish arguments down as easily as Michael Jordan slam dunk basketballs. Slam dunk, two points, in your face and you don't even know you lost the game. They laughed at him and made illogical remarks that meant nothing, the prosaic nonsense of the ill-informed and uneducated. But by any standard debate rules, Dr. Paul obliterated every single one of their arguments. We are delighted that we're over there because Osama bin Laden has said, I am glad you're over on our sand because we can target you so much easier. They have already now, since that time, have killed 3,400 of our men, and I don't think it was necessary. Wendell, may I make a comment on that? That's really an extraordinary statement. That's an extraordinary statement as someone who lived through the attack of September 11 that we invited the attack because we were attacking Iraq. I don't think I've ever heard that before, and I've heard some pretty absurd explanations for September 11. <laughs> and I would, I would ask the congressman to withdraw that comment and tell us that he didn't really mean that. Congressman? I believe very sincerely that the, that the CIA is correct when they teach and, and talk about blowback. When we went into uh, Iran in 1953 and installed the Shah, yes, there was blowback. 
uh, the reaction to that was the taking of our hostages, and that persists. And if we ignore that, we ignore that at our own risk. That if we think that we can do what we want around the world and not incite hatred, then we then we have a problem. They don't come here to attack us because we're rich and we're free. They come and they, and they attack us because we're over there. I mean, what would we think if we were uh, if other foreign countries were doing that to us? Imagine for a moment that somewhere in the middle of Texas, there was a large foreign military base, say Chinese or Russian. 30 seconds, please. No, 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 wait a second. Let's all get I was so amazed by Dr. Paul's debate performance, I knew I had to learn more about him, and I had to get on his team. Little did I know that hundreds of thousands of other people of all races, ages, and backgrounds would think exactly the same. In my mind, Dr. Paul won the debates easily, and then the media howled foul when we all text in, one text per phone, that Ron Paul destroyed them and won the debate by a huge margin. Of Hannity and, Combs. and before we get to our next guest, let's take a look at the results so far for tonight's you vote in first place with 33 percent. Ron Paul, the Paulites, I hey, guess, well, busy well, 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 dialing well, 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 and redialing yeah. on you the phone. You know what? They're, they're redialing uh, by the. And side. then they said we hacked into their system, dialing over and over again. And, Combs, and we are coming to you live tonight from the spin room at the GOP presidential debate in Orlando, Florida. Now it is time to reveal the results from our text messaging poll. As of now, in first place. Ron Paul, 39 percent. In second place, Mike the Huckabee, run, they're getting 19 percent of the vote. Can I snap the ball is down. Dempsey kicks. It's on the way. It is. Good. Of the vote. Can I say something? And uh, they're you stacking. Say something? Yeah, they're stacking the deck. That's the way they have it every campaign. He did not win this debate. Period. Right, well, I'm just telling you. The very first thing I did when Mason was born was protect him from the 54 vaccinations that the pharmaceutical companies now have for our children that are filled with chemicals and heavy metals that cause brain damage and are the direct cause of autism. Plus, vaccinations contain animal embryo cells that, in the least, are not kosher, and in the worst, an ethical nightmare. When I was a child, there were only seven vaccinations. There was no way I would ever have anyone stick a dirty needle into my son. Absolutely not. I think they do the exact opposite. I think they weaken their immune systems. And uh, I think they're better off without them. Uh, for instance, mercury, formaldehyde. Uh, they use acetone. sick. He, he built his immune system um, naturally, so he's sick less often than most kids. And a lot of kids are more hyperactive, I guess you could say, ADD, or the opposite. They're more sluggish, less energy. I think he's more able to focus in class or with um, extracurricular activities like baseball today. He's more able to focus on the game, whereas other kids are, they're just looking at the butterfly, catching butterflies instead of catching the baseball. I would recommend to other parents who are indecisive about vaccinating their children to do research on vaccines. Uh, research what is in them, how they're made. Um, a lot of people, they'll look at um, what they're eating, what's in their food. They'll read the nutrition facts. and but they don't read what is in your vaccines, what you're putting in your body. Do your research before, before doing it. Pros and cons. Um, I don't, I don't want to sound bad when saying this. I love my son to death, but if, if I could have chosen, I wouldn't have raised a child. I, it's, not, it's not a world to raise a child. The Amish are a good example of this. In the Amish community, they do not vaccinate their children, and they have not one single case of autism. And because of the way they eat, they don't have any heart disease either. What's going on in America?
In August 2007, I met a woman named Stephanie Burns who was registering people to vote and had put together a list of libertarians and like-minded people to see if we could raise some money for Dr. Paul. Stephanie put the list together and I did the invitations. On September 13, 2007, we raised an unprecedented $120,000. Their staff said it had never happened when before. When we were inviting the Libertarians, we didn't get that great of a response. And then when I was calling Republicans, we didn't get that great of a response. But when I got a list of people who had donated to Dr. Paul, I just sat down on my couch, it was on a Sunday, and started, you know, fairly early in the morning, not too early, and then went all night long and just got an incredible response. We were charging $500 for a breakfast midweek and also $500 for a lunch. So, I mean, they, that was a lot to expect of people. It and was, yet, you know, you're thinking, oh, well, campaigns, you have these so much per plate dinners and it's all for rich people but so many people donated money and that couldn't make it or they donated extra money that everybody that worked really hard on the campaign that didn't have the money was able to come it was really beautiful as he was speaking people were gathering outside the hotel with signs and chanting and all sorts of things and then when we were done we went out and walked. It was probably about 11 blocks. So we had this march that was about three blocks long in the financial district at like midday. So you know, all the suits were there. <laughs> and the media stopped and did a very long interview with him. And you could just tell. I mean, it just had the feeling of a movement and just so much momentum. And you could just tell how, how happy it, it made him feel. did the interview with him during the march it was it was incredible i mean the the fellow that was interviewing him asked really good questions and talked to him for quite a while so then we all went home turned on our tvs and nope not there and it was because there was a sinkhole in san francisco that day so you know that was much more important than the state of our country Remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder, treason, and plot. On November 5th, 2007, Guy Fawkes Day, but more to the point, V for Vendetta Day, based on the movie, and the graphic novel written by Alan Moore and illustrated by David Lloyd. Much like George Orwell's 1984, where the government gets out of control, terrorizing its own people with draconian laws, an idea form that we could have a website and raise money for Ron Paul. Then Trevor Lyman made the website Remember Remember the 5th of November, a brilliant PR idea to link the movie while also reminding you to actually give on that date. We raised $5 million in one day for the congressman. I say we because we, the newly branded Tea Party, were now a force to be reckoned. The Republican presidential candidate Ron Paul raised big bucks and some uh, major eyebrows with a very successful one-day internet fundraising drive. In amazing, amazing number. In twenty-four hours, that's one hundred eighty-two thousand five hundred dollars per hour. $3,042 per second. It's an amazing sum of money. I don't remember someone doing that out on the campaign trail. What do you make of this? 
Well, and the source of the money is, is to me what's interesting. He got it from 35,000 small, comparatively small contributors. And to what do you attribute that success? The message. The message is powerful, and the level of frustration in this country that people are sick and tired of what they're getting, and they're angry, and they're upset. They don't like the war, and they don't like the economy, and they like the answers that I've been giving. I started writing op-eds to the local East Bay newspaper, the Contra Costa Times. Six letters were published. I wrote about Ron Paul, of course. I really started learning a great deal about the man himself. According to Dr. Paul's wife, Carolyn, in high school, Ron Paul ran the 100-yard dash in 9.8 seconds. It's really quite amazing because that's Olympic time. Let me give you an example of Olympic time. The fastest man in the world, Usain Bolt, ran the 100-meter sprint, a little more than 100 yards, in 9.58 seconds. Ron Paul would have been right on his heels. And Dr. Paul was in the Air Force. Ah, a fellow flyboy. I served in the Air Force from 1982 to 1987 in the 92nd Bombardment Squadron Fairchild Air Force Base, Strategic Air Command, in Spokane, Washington. The mightiest bomber in history. Here is Mason and I at the Spokane River in 2012. In 1994, a B-52 bomber crashed at Fairchild just after a shooting occurred. The similarities to future events cause me to add this video. Four people died due to the misconduct of the pilot who is known to have been reckless with the B-52s for many years. Watch as the plane tries to hit the tower. To my trained eye, this plane seems remotely controlled. Notice the non-reaction of the cameraman. Many cameras are there that fateful day. As an ex-Air Force serviceman, I could tell you, cameras are ordered to go where they are needed to go. It's not a coincidence that they are there. None of the other candidates were ever in the service except for Dr. Paul and John McCain. John McCain was hospitalized in Vietnam when he was shot down. He broke both arms while ejecting and was then hit in his right shoulder with the butt of a rifle, hospitalized, and then released back to the United States. How was he released from prison in Vietnam? But more important, how was he in a hospital at all? where most of our captured boys were in prisoner of war camps, dying of dysentery and malaria, tortured and starved. Captain McCain was treated in the Hanoi hospital. Broke my leg and both arms and went into a lake. Evidently, McCain was supposedly granted his freedoms after his captors obtained the information they needed from him. It didn't take them very long to gain that information. Offer a cigarette, an enhanced interrogation technique that actually works. I really thought that John McCain was an American hero until I found out the truth. I also thought that Lance Armstrong was a hero too. I'm not saying that my best defense is I've never tested positive. All I'm saying is that the last few years when you were supposed to tell the investigators... Make a comment. I, I, I'm, I'm not interested in trading with Al-Qaeda. All they want to trade is burqas. <laughs> I don't want to travel with them. They like one-way tickets. <laughs> Governor Huckabee, may, may I answer that? May I answer that? Yes, Congressman. 
I'm talking exactly about that because that's what we have been doing. We used to support Saddam Hussein and we used to be allied with Osama bin Laden. And what I want to do is stop that. Who are our friends one day turn out to be our enemies. Right now we finally got rid of uh, Saddam Hussein and what are we doing now? We're rearming the Sunnis, the old henchmen of Saddam Hussein. And what are they going to do with There's all those weapons we're giving the Sunnis in, in, uh, in Baghdad? So look out. Believe me, that war is not over. And right now they're demanding more troops in Afghanistan. And we're, some people, like the senator, he thinks we should be there for a hundred years if necessary. How can he commit the young people of this world five more generations to be in Iraq if it's necessary? I say it's I time ahead. to come Go home. Ahead, senator McCain, you got that. Dr. Paul, on the other hand, was drafted. Here he is on his bike with his famous son, Rand Paul, Senator of Kentucky, Doctor of Optometry, who recently spoke out in a filibuster against President Obama's drone policy of assassinating American citizens on American soil. So I have all these rules, and that's what the President answered. When he was at Google campus a couple of weeks ago, they asked him the question, can you kill Americans on American soil? And he, he said, well, the rules will probably be different outside the U.S. than inside which basically means, yes, he thinks he can kill Americans on American soil, but he's going to have some rules. Don't worry about it, because he will make some rules, and there will be a process, but it won't be due process. It'll be a process that he sets up in secret in the White House, and I, I, I don't find that acceptable. Actor John Cusack, an outspoken Democrat, tweeted, For God's sake, where are the Democrats? And... The Attorney General says it's okay to kill U.S. citizens and other bad guys, but trust us, we're the good guys. How'd that play out through history, Mr. Holder? Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. The great and powerful O has spoken. And then he went on to tweet, When you kill innocent people without trial and imprison them with no trial, what would you call it? You used Bush powers and expanded them. The filibuster lasted almost 13 hours. Dr. Paul served as an in-flight surgeon in the Air Force. After his honorable discharge, Dr. Paul started an OGBYN practice and went on to deliver 4,000 babies. In 1980, Dr. Paul ran for president on the Libertarian Party ticket. I remembered seeing him on the Morton Downey Jr. TV show. Mort was smoking cigarettes, weirdly enough, and Dr. Paul was arguing personal liberty. Ironically, about drug laws, which would put him in a hot seat time and time again, throughout which Dr. Paul never changed his stance on the drug laws, or the war on drugs, that according to Dr. Paul, placed a disproportionate amount of black Americans in prison. This is wrong. Cooler, will you please? How can you call for something that I think is un-American, the legalization of drugs in this country? Because I detest the use of drugs, and I think we would have a lot less drugs used if they were legal. I think it's part of the American system to let people make freedom of choices. We let them read literature and pick and choose what they should read and study. We let them pick which religion they want to follow, very important subjects. So we let people in a free society make their decisions on what's best for their body. We think that smoking oh, sometimes... Some of these comments, as we just heard from Brian Spice, are pretty shocking. Yeah, it is, and of course it's been rehashed a long time, and it's coming up now for political reasons. But everybody knows in my district that I didn't write them and I don't speak like that. No, but the point is, is when you bring this question up, you're really saying you're a racist or are you a racist? And the answer is no, I'm, I'm not a racist. Matter of fact, Rosa Parks is one of my heroes. Martin Luther King is a hero because they practice the libertarian principle of civil disobedience, nonviolence. Libertarians are incapable of being a racist because uh, racism is a collectivist idea. You see people in group. A, a civil libertarian like myself see everybody as an important individual. It's not the color of their skin that is important, as Martin Luther King said. What is important is the character of the, of the individual. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Never have I heard any politician say anything about the war on blacks, as has Dr. Paul. What the American dream means? It means removing the barriers of prejudice and misunderstanding that still exist in America. It means fighting to eliminate discrimination from every corner 
of our country. It means changing hearts and changing minds and making sure that every American is treated equally under the law. On December 16, 2007, Tea Party Day, we raised $6.75 million in a 24-hour period on the internet, topping our previous record of $5 million. We were stunned. We now had a chance at raising money that equaled the other candidates. The media downplayed it, of course, as they continued to ignore, ridicule, and laugh at the good doctor and his constitutional stance. We knew then that something was amiss. Too many coincidences occurred for us to believe there wasn't a combined effort against Dr. Paul to shut him out and shut him down. Everywhere we turned, the media was lambasting him, trying to vilify his impeccable character. They only succeeded in making more fools of themselves. The Federal Reserve, <laughs> the Department of Homeland Security, <laughs> Medicare. Potential hopeful Ron Paul is back with us. Good to see you, Congressman. Thank you. Nice to be with you. I got very angry with you tonight. Oh, my. I uh, know. We, we have some agreements first time? on the... Is that no, first time ever? No, not the first time ever. <laughs> you should be no, nice to here's your what guests. By, you, oh, well, first off, uh, you know, you have Pakistan, and they're not exactly the most pro Okay, but I'm talking country. about Iran, Congressman. I'm not talking about Pakistan well, why not, at this point. Well, why don't you ever let me, uh, you know, answer, answer the question? Because you're not directly answer answering the question. the question, sir. What's success for you in this campaign? What's success? Um, what well, win is one, one is the That's goal. That's not going to happen. Cong Congressman Paul, uh, yet another question about electability. Uh, do you have any, sir? There is always the question as to whether or not <laughs> you are in fact viable. Your differences with the Republicans on the, uh, the, with the rest of the Republicans on this stage has raised questions about whether or not you can actually win the general, the Republican nomination, sir. So you suggesting the Republicans should write me off because I'm a strict constitutionalist? I'm the most conservative member here. I have voted, you know, against more spending and wasting government than anybody else. So you're suggesting that I'm not electable and the Republicans don't want me because I'm a strict fiscal conservative? because I believe in civil liberties? Why should we not be, be defending civil liberties? And why should we not be de talking about foreign policy that used to be the part of the Republican Party? Mr. Republican Robert Taft didn't even want us to be in NATO. And you're saying now that we have to continue to borrow money from China to finance this empire that we can't afford? I, let me see if I get this right. We, we need to borrow $10 billion from China, and then we give it to Musharraf, who's a military dictator who overthrew an elected government, and then we go to war, we lose all these lives promoting democracy in Iraq. I mean, what's going on here? My son turned one that January 24th, 2008, and a lot had happened in that year. He was a baldy baby, a term I used to describe children who were not born with hair, nor does the hair gene kick in until they are two years old or so. I was a baldy baby, my daughter Casey was a baldy baby, and my son Mason was a baldy baby. Walking and talking, laughing and playing, I was very concerned about my son's future and the future of our country. That year, I noticed the warmongers were using propaganda rhetoric about the terrorists and Al-Qaeda and 9-11 to condition the public to get on board the war train. Global terrorism, global terrorism, global terrorism, 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 the evil terrorists, 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 terrorists. Propaganda is an interesting tactic we in advertising have used for many years. The father of all propaganda was a man named Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays was a famous public relations ad man back in the early 20th century. Both Hitler and Goebbels spoke of him fondly and used his technique of, if you tell a big lie enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. Bernays' book, Propaganda, was treated as a handbook by Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister. Es mag gut sein, Macht zu besitzen, die auf Gewehren ruht. Besser aber und beglückender ist es, das Herz eines Volkes zu gewinnen und es auch zu behalten. Rinse and repeat. They use the same techniques today. It's frightening. 
Another term that is used is called framing. A frame is a conceptual structure used in thinking. The word elephant evokes a frame with an image of an elephant. The frame could be a room, and there could be an elephant in the room. Every frame is realized in the brain by neural circuitry and neurotransmission. Every time a neural circuit is activated and transmitted, it is strengthened. Some political frames I hear are tax relief, fiscal cliff, terrorism, conspiracy theorist, sequester. Fiscal cliff. No one wants to go over a cliff, especially a cliff where all their money will be lost. So, you better make a decision very quickly. The government sequester is that certain programs and activities are exempt from sequestration. It's called cronyism. Citigroup replaces J.P. Morgan as White House Chief of Staff. Behind that headline is a tangled web. The new Chief of Staff is Jack Lew. He used to work for the giant banking conglomerate Citigroup. His predecessor as Chief of Staff is Bill Daly, who used to work at the giant banking conglomerate J.P. Morgan Chase. Daly was maestro of the bank's global lobbying and the chief liaison to the White House. Bill Daly replaced Obama's first chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, who once worked for a Wall Street firm where he was paid a reported $18.5 million in less than three years. The new chief of staff, Jack Lew, comes from Obama's Office of Management and Budget, where he replaced Peter Orzak, who now works as vice chairman for global banking at the giant conglomerate Citigroup. Still following me? Conspiracy theorist. Conspiracy evokes an overwhelming emotion of futility. Theorist says that is not scientifically possible. It's just a theory. You can't prove it. Shame on you. In reality, a theory is cause for scientific investigation, right? Naomi Wolf, Clinton's speechwriter, tells an even scarier tale in her book, um, The End of America. Of it. You still have courts and you still have elections. And you even still have arts and media and newspapers. But you don't have freedom. And it happens so fast. You see this again and again. So today, four years, five years after I wrote that book, the American president has said it's legal, he's entitled to assassinate Americans without trial, and has done so. And you know that the law now gives the president the power to call any of us sitting here, no matter what we've done or haven't done, a terrorist. Which means the president can assassinate any American anywhere without due trial. If we don't change things, due process. Um, you create a thug caste, mercenaries, who are not part of civil society um, policing. So the brilliant founders of our country uh, created the, the um, Second Amendment, which called for well-regulated militias. This means the National Guard. Who does the National Guard report to? The governors, the people, us. There are people. They protect us. The founders did this because they knew what it was like to have mercenaries, uh, German and British mercenaries, breaking into people's homes without warrant, searching through their possessions, taking their stuff, frightening their children and their wives and their men. And so this is why we have this. You don't have military policing in America. The dramatic scene played out in front of our cameras. Parents grabbing their children and running after spending the night hunkering in their houses and then finding themselves face to face with the muzzle of a SWAT officer's rifle. It's a little stressful. It was a little stressful seeing these guys uh, pointing big guns and you're holding your daughter in your arms, but um, they're, they're doing the right thing. You know, they're trying to secure the neighborhood. Each time the SWAT team would rescue a family at the point of a gun, they would rush into the home in an armed line, guns ready in case the suspect was hiding inside. Each time they cleared out a residence, they did it with a force that reflected the uncertainty of not knowing who was a friend and who was a foe. And he banged on the door, I looked up, I was shocked, and there was a gun, or two guns or whatever, pointing down at me and the guys, and they said, get out, get out. I said, okay, and I wanted to know, uh, you know, do I get my shoes? So he just get out, get out, okay, all right. The pattern dramatically repeated house after house, but finally it came.
became apparent the families were out of their homes and the suspect was not inside. About an hour later, the drama picked up suddenly again as officers rushed to a house in what had been a safe area. They broke down one door and then took the people cowering in the house next door out, their hands on their heads. It was terrifying. Well, now Blackwater has opened a giant facility in Illinois, and there's another one in South Carolina, and there's another one in San Diego. And there are people at protests like the G20 in Pittsburgh who are reporting again and again that unmarked police officers are showing up with no identification and being more abusive and more violent than any of the municipal police who are accountable. Hey, hey, hey. Do you understand the seriousness of that? And Homeland Security is merging and, and synchronizing with local policing. This is happening in Manhattan as well. Not accountable to the people, not what our founders intended, terrifying. Brown shirts, black shirts. This is not an exaggeration, this is tactically what happens. Um, surveillance is the fourth step. In every closing society, you get a system that uh, spies on citizens, innocent citizens. East Germany, again, uh, Nazi Germany. The Patriot Acts are closely modeled on the wording of uh, something called the Enabling Acts in Germany um, that gave the state the right or the power to read people's mail, listen in on their phone calls. Obama, you know, this whole attack I made in 2007 in the end of America was against Bush. It's not partisan. Obama is making it worse. He's making it worse, and he's making it worse because no American president is free at this point to buck these powerful interests that see great profit, billions and trillions of dollars, in maintaining a security state, a surveillance state, and now eight wars of choice around the world that the American people did not vote for. They use these methods to manipulate the public, to condition them to believe they will be safe if they take away our rights with their new laws like the Patriot Act, which take away our Fourth Amendment rights against illegal search and seizure. The TSA practices illegal searches every single day, molesting our wives, sisters, children, and mothers, taking naked pictures of them. Is the TSA immune to child pornography? I've been boycotting the airlines ever since the perversion started. How others can stand by and watch their families be sexually abused and molested right in front of them is beyond me. They told me to go through the scanner and I said, I don't want to go through there. I want to go through this line. That's why I came this line and waited behind other people. I mean, the other line was empty. It seems like nobody wants to use that scanner or go through it. So I waited in line. And the guy said, well, you don't have to go through the scanner, but if you opt out, you're going to get a full body pat down. And I said, fine. And this was the second time that this has happened to me. It happened to me at LAX before on my way to Rio. And now I'm going home. Um, so I'm flying through Dallas. And um, the pat down at Dallas airport was completely different than the one I got at LAX. And I'm sure this woman was just doing her job, but she, I mean, she actually felt, touched my vagina. And so I think that's why I'm crying and that's why I'm so emotional because I'm already so upset that they're making me go, making me do this, making me choose to either get molested, because that's what I feel like, and, or, or go through this machine that's completely unhealthy and dangerous. Yeah, but my, my phone's gonna run out of room. You can't touch my daughter unless I can record it. Well, you understand what I mean. It's okay, baby. Yes. I'm 
After they've dosed you with radiation, I understand. Sure, I will not say anything else. I will not say anything else. I'll give you a copy. It's okay. Let me give you my card, okay? I understand. They shouldn't do that to anybody. Send me an email and I'll send you a copy of the video, okay? That's awesome. <laughs> I don't understand. We got 35 people that ride a train in front of It is in a three ounce container, though. Our Fourth Amendment rights have been destroyed by more insidious acts like the Military Commissions Act, suspending posse comitatus, the act that forbids standing armies in public places, local county law versus federal law. The federal law can now place federal law enforcement and the military in county jurisdiction. The National Defense Authorization Act, no charges, no representation, indefinitely imprisoned, no due process. The Violent Radicalization and Homegrown Terrorism Prevention Act takes away your constitutional rights. Think illegal imprisonment of Japanese Americans during World War II. More than 100,000 men, women, and children, all of Japanese ancestry, removed from their homes in the Pacific Coast state to wartime communities established in out-of-the-way places. Different relocation centers in unsettled parts of California, Arizona, Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, and Arizona. Japs evacuate vital West Coast areas for the national security. At Los Angeles, 36,000 Japs see the handwriting on the wall and sell out their goods before their voluntary departure. The United States government was targeting Japanese Americans. It wasn't looking at other minority groups that the country was at war against. Italians, Germans, only the Japanese. The presidents must be reminded that they too are subject to the law, and the law must insist. The law must always be obeyed. Once we depart from that rule of law, there's no stopping them. The Stop Online Piracy Act will make it possible for companies to block the domain names of websites that are simply capable of, or seem to encourage, copyright infringement. The reason that blocking a domain name isn't effective is because any block site can still be accessed via its numeric IP address and would allow rights holders to cut off the source of funding of any potentially infringing website. This means any other companies doing business with this site would have to stop. The Bush-Clinton-Bush-Obama administrations is duly noted for their crony capitalism. Many businesses reap huge riches by virtue of their association with government. Large corporations in bed with weak government is cause for much disease. Our potential violations of law. Perhaps you can explain to this committee how a secretary of the treasury can justify punishing an unwise but lawful act while ignoring potentially illegal ones. Well, in, in terms of leg legality... Could, could you speak closer to the mic? Yeah, I, I would say in terms of legality, I, I think that's... I, I'm, I'm not... I, I certainly don't feel qualified to, to, to sit here and opine 
on whether uh, wh whether there was an illegal action. A and I, I certainly have not uh, not seen evidence of, a of, a of an illegal action, and that is. The oil cartel, automotive giants, agricultural conglomerates, banks too big to fail, the pharmaceutical industry, and insurance companies are among the legally privileged cronies that are profiting at the expense of threatened competitors and of customers who pay the higher prices. Mortgage-backed securities, Fannie, Freddie, uh, Ginnie Mae, and then a, a couple trillion or so that are left uh, from the uh, private uh, label issuance. All of those were powerfully and massively affected yesterday by the announcement of the Fed and the smart traders were positioned, laughed all the way to the bank, and captured the windfall. Now, now th how are the people in America ever going to be sold on capitalism when it's so obvious the system is rigged? And I don't say that from some kind of conspiracy point of view. I say that because Wall Street is cheek by jowl with the Fed. Wall Street demanded this. Wall Street said it would have a hissy fit if they didn't do it. Bernanke is weak, and the rest of that crowd around him is even weaker. I mean, did you see? Eleven attacks, sir. Ron Paul spoke against the warmongers and how the rest of the world hate us not because we're free, but because we have been bombing them for decades. The reasons they attacked us, they, they attack us because we've been over there. We've been bombing Iraq for 10 years. We've been in. We should not be bombing any countries in our war on terror because we're actually the terrorizers. Nobody's bombing us. People bring up 9 11, and I say, 19 people from Saudi Arabia. We didn't bomb Saudi Arabia. The wars overseas are absolutely immoral and there's no justification to be over there whatsoever killing innocent civilians that they call collateral damage. Well, you know, the damage that we're inflicting upon all those nations is, is absolutely preposterous. It's, it's something I can't even wrap my mind around. Of. I can even imagine coming home and having all my family dead by bombs. I would, I would go insane. I think, well, bombing is, uh, it causes too many casualties, innocent casualties. Um, I feel that um, um, more special ops type of a situation where it's a smaller crew but it's targeted, uh, it would be beneficial if it's something that we really have to do without any, uh, any wonder if it's that what we're doing is right. We need to be certain that these are the people involved create covert operations in other countries and bomb other countries and involve innocent civilians of other countries that don't need to be involved. In the name of this vague sort of war on terror, um, you're, you're halfway down, a, uh, once again, you're halfway down a very slippery slope that's going to lead to excusing other actions that are inexcusable as far as I'm concerned. So no, I don't think that we need to be bombing other countries. If you're answering it from a military perspective, you would expect an answer that would include something like, well, we have to take out our targets, or bombing certainly is a, is a, a quicker way uh, to either end the war, cease the war, or uh, at least to slow it down, because they can actually say, well, it saves lives. Uh, in some respect, they could argue that, that side. <laughs> um, when we're faced with war, it's ugly on all sides. Nobody gets a free pass on war and the atrocities that occur. Uh, I don't think you can conduct a war on terrorism without some sort of um, military uh, use of bombing and perhaps drones too. No. I don't think anybody should ever bomb anybody else. Unless you have been put on trial and proven guilty, you should not have your whole home and your whole life and your whole family and everything you love be taken away from you. No, I don't think it's moral. Um, I could never agree with somebody 
bombing someone because it, it you know, a lot of times when areas are bombed, it's like, yeah, maybe there are some soldiers down there, and yeah, maybe there are some people that you may not like, but that's one in 10,000 people that you just killed. What makes that one person be the deciding factor that an entire, an entire country is, can go down for? Because of that one person that nobody has proven anything against. No, I, it, it, it makes me sick when innocent v civilians are killed just because people are either retaliating or showing power. It makes me sick. Killing, maiming, slaughtering, and yes, murdering innocent civilians, especially women and children. You're clear. All right, clearing. Let me know when you get it. Watch you. Light them all up. Come on, fire. can't educate our young people, but we can bomb the shit out of your country, all right? Huh? We can bomb the shit out of your country, all right? Especially if your country is full of brown people. Oh, we like that, don't we? That's our hobby. That's our new job in the world, bombing brown people. Iraq, Panama, Grenada, Libya, you got some brown people in your country, tell them to watch the fuck out or we'll goddamn bomb them. Well, when's the last white people you can remember that we bombed? Can you remember the last white, can you remember any white people we've ever bombed? The Germans, the Germans are the only ones and the only reason for that is because they were trying to cut in on our action. They wanted to dominate the world. Bullshit, that's our fucking job. That's our fucking job! So why do they think it's okay to bomb people around the world, especially brown people? What if it happened here in my country, to my son? What if I came home and found pieces of my son and my family blasted apart? On The Economy, Ron Paul told us that the printing of money, creating inflation, and devaluing the currency is the real problem. Yes, I, I think this is not a consequence of free markets. What's happening is there's transfer of wealth from the poor and the middle class to the wealthy. This comes about because of a monetary system that we have. When you inflate a currency or, or destroy a currency, the middle class gets wiped out. So the people who get to use the money first, which is created by the Federal Reserve System, benefit. So the money gravitates to the banks and to Wall Street. So that's why you have more billionaires than ever before. Today, this country is in the, 
in, in the middle of a recession for a lot of people. Michigan knows about it. Poor people know about it. The middle class knows about it. Wall Street doesn't know about it. Washington, D.C. doesn't know about it. But it's because of the monetary system and the excessive spending. As long as we live beyond our means, we are destined to live beneath our means. And we have lived beyond our means because we are financing a foreign policy that is so extravagant and beyond what we can control, as well as the spending here at home. And we're depending on the creation of money out of thin air, which is nothing more than the basement of the currency. It's counterfeit. And it is a natural, predictable consequence that you're going to have people benefit from it and other people suffer. So if you want a healthy economy, you have to study monetary theory and figure out why it is that we're suffering. And everybody doesn't suffer equally or this wouldn't be so bad. It's always the poor people, those on retired incomes, that suffer the most. But the politicians and those who get to use the money first, like the military industrial complex, they make a lot of money and Thank they you. benefit from it. Thank you. In the last four years, the economy has affected me in a very negative sense. I uh, was laid off in 2008 uh, from advertising. I was an art director and one of our main clients was GM. GM got bailed out by the government, which basically means the people and they went overseas and everybody lost their jobs and they were probably 258 million dollar a year client and I went on unemployment decided to start my own business uh, in the last four years the economy has affected me probably less than most people um, I live off passive income, I have since I was 22, so for the last 19 years I've, I've been retired, for lack of a better term. My income's tax-free. Because of that, I'm sort of insulated from a lot of the problems that I think a lot of other people struggle with. However, moving the back to my native California after 26 years, the cost of living here is so much higher that um, I've definitely felt it, especially with the state's own issues, you know, just raised income tax and our sales tax. I was desperate. I was uh, renting out rooms to people so that I could make ends meet, uh, which was not the best thing when you have a small child. Um, and then uh, I went back to school because I didn't want to be without an education, especially when the economy got harder and more difficult. Well, uh, personally, it has affected me because as an entrepreneur or being self-employed, I'm dependent on the economy for business. Mm -hmm. um, in my own field, uh, where I like to develop businesses, uh, it's important that the financial institutions are sound and that they have money to lend. If they don't have money to lend, the people that I want to help build their business are at a, 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 a real negative. So I have to find other ways for them to create money uh, so they can start their business. Yeah. First, I was kind of thinking it was kind of a cop out. You know, people were using the bad economy as like an excuse, you know. But more and more as it drags on, I mean, I realize like really every day, you know. I mean, you know, even the high gas prices, I mean, you know, affect daily life. So. Well, in the last four years, the way the economy has been, I've actually been in denial. I've been kind of hiding out and trying to make things work and not really paying attention like I should have. So, I've been living fine. <laughs> no, no, but I have quarters and pennies in the I'd save them. I would buy a speaker, a telephone, and a real cell phone, but, and um, a mustache, a, a real mustache, and when our Treasury Department prints money based upon nothing, it devalues our currency. Seems that many people really didn't understand what Ron Paul was saying. So I wanted to tell people a more detailed explanation for them to really understand what that meant. For an example, I like to tell people, if you had a Babe Ruth baseball card, it would be worth a lot of money. But if you printed 27.4 trillion Babe Ruth baseball cards, they would be worth nothing. Simple, right? Should be, but still, only a few people really understand the meaning. Another example I use is what Dr. Paul also taught all of us. 
the price of gold and silver. In 2003, gold was around $350 per ounce and silver was around $8 per ounce. In 2011, gold shot up to $1,900 an ounce and silver, respectfully, soared to $35 an ounce. They laughed at the good doctor's idea of the dollar based upon the rare metals, saying that it was an old idea. However, the truth is, while not backed by gold, our currency is still based in gold. If we get into trouble. Look at it this way. In 1913, before the Federal Reserve took over, and also in 1950, you could buy a gallon of gasoline for one silver dime. Today, that same silver dime is worth around $4, the price of a gallon of gas. In 1913, the Federal Reserve, a privately owned company about as federal as Federal Express, took over our currency to stabilize our economy. However, today, the dollar is devalued 98% of what it was worth. That's right, your dollar today is worth two pennies. Dr. Paul says we should abolish the Federal Reserve, and I say, good riddance to bad rubbish. But I also think we should tax them. They're a privately owned bank, and they should pay at least a 17% tax of all the profit they made from us, retroactively. pretty significant, because if you can control money, you're really controlling one half of every single transaction. So that is a tremendous amount of power. But uh, it doesn't look like we're going to have any independence. Uh, they say the Federal Reserve is independent, but that's a bunch of nonsense. I remember telling my brother in 2008 to take everything he had and convert it to gold and silver. He owns a popular fast food restaurant in New Jersey called Wendy's. He said he had a million and a half tied up in his business and couldn't do it. Well, Richard, if you had, you would have 2.5 times that amount enough to own three more Wendy's or start that Italian restaurant you were always talking about. If one would have invested $8 million in silver then, today they would have $35 million. That's $27 million of profit courtesy of the Federal Reserve inflation. The dollar is not based in gold, you say? Think again. When George Bush Jr. started his presidency in 2000, oil was at $24 a barrel. In eight years, it soared to $150 a barrel. Seems that commodities do very well indeed in a fiat currency Ponzi scheme. Thank you, Dr. Paul, for teaching us these simple truths. The best way to defeat this enemy in the long run is to deny them the recruiting tools that are and, and recruitments made, capable, made possible by resentment. In 2009, the price of gas in Libya was 13 cents a gallon. Gaddafi wanted to sell his oil not in the American petrodollar, but in the gold dinar. Healthcare, education, and housing were all free. You could even buy a car and the Libyan government would pay half of the price. Gaddafi said that even his parents who lived in a tent would not get a house until everyone in Libya had one first. That madman even deposited the profits from the nation's oil reserves in every Libyan's bank account. The great man-made river, referred to in the Guinness Book of World Records as the wonder of the modern world, was built by Gaddafi. The media dubbed him a madman for spending $33 billion on the project. So what do they think of the Federal Reserve and our Treasury for printing $44 billion every month? Sane? In Libya, land was freely given to any Libyan that wanted to become a farmer. Land, a house, farming equipment, livestock, and even the seeds themselves for planting. Gaddafi even negotiated many ceasefires across Africa and wanted to create the United States of Africa. In the late 80s, Muammar Gaddafi publicly criticized the Ministry for Mass Mobilization and Revolutionary Leadership to restrict their violence and judicial role. He asserted that they deviated, harmed, and tortured Libyan citizens, and that the true revolutionary does not practice repression. Gaddafi then released hundreds of political prisoners. They also didn't have a central bank, 
nor did they have any debt. But during the invasion, the rebels, fighting by day against an oppressive regime and by night starting a central bank, didn't take kindly to the 10 million Libyan march in favor of Gaddafi. They didn't show that on the nightly news. Oh no, they only said, with no factual video evidence, that Gaddafi was supposedly killing his own people. A great excuse to go bomb and kill some more innocent people and bomb their infrastructure, schools, universities, hospitals, power grids, steal their gold dinar, steal their oil, and destroy their economy. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood persecutes black Africans by ethnic cleansing, meaning mass murders, and putting many blacks in cages, further enslaving them. All in the guise of humanitarian purposes. Those revolutionaries sure should start time management seminars And President Obama, our first African-American president, he should get the Nobel Peace Prize for assisting in the slaughtering of Africans. Ron Paul warned us that our economy was being destroyed and that it's directly related to our foreign policy. But the media wasn't buying it. They slammed him, and the new fake Tea Party suddenly supported the war on terror. Good evening. My name is Congresswoman Michelle Bachman from Minnesota's 6th District. I want to thank the Tea Party Express and Tea Party. Welcome back to Harbor. We saw thousands of Tea Partiers rally in Washington on tax day last week, and a recent Politico poll actually shows the movement is split between social conservatives who look to Sarah Palin as their leader and libertarians who support Congressman Ron Paul. Congressman Ron Paul is with us tonight. It's an honor to have you, sir. You're a leader of a movement. Sometimes you remind me of my hero growing up, who was, in fact, Barry Goldwater. Oh, what? And, uh, yes. and then I grew up. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. The media did its job well dividing and conquering. But still, we did not stop. After winning every single debate, Dr. Paul's numbers started to rise. College kids across the country started to burn dollar bills at the Ron Paul rallies. They yelled and chanted, end the Fed, end the Fed. They were waking up to the fact that the real problem was the Federal Reserve and crony capitalism. And they're starting to realize that this prosperity comes from too much borrowing and too much spending and too much inflation. The jig was up. The cat was out of the bag. They could not hide the fact that the Fed was printing money and the bailouts were saving their friends like Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs and Bank of America from taking huge losses in their failed derivatives market, who, incidentally, supported both Romney and Obama. The warrior spirit. The warrior spirit where everything is gained by going out and robbing and killing and plundering. And, uh, today Ron Paul's message was bulletproof. Freedom was becoming very popular indeed, and the media got very scared. Not surprisingly, Dr. Paul lost the nomination. Songbird McCain was the new candidate. And I am very, very grateful and pleased to note that tonight, my friends, we have won enough delegates 
to claim with confidence, humility, and a great sense of responsibility that I will be the Republican nominee for President of the United States. I was disheartened, but I was not out. Something was occurring in America. People were waking up by leaps and bounds. Candidates were running on the fake Tea Party ticket, but more importantly, Ron Pollikins, as I named them, were winning local seats in government and in the GOP. We had had enough of the neocons, the warmongers, and the Keynesian economists. Our faith that freedom really works. That summer, I met up with Corey Rowe, Dylan Avery, and Luke Grudowski. Luke and Corey were putting together a benefit to raise money for the first responders of Ground Zero on 9-11, called 2008, Now or Never. Many of the first responders were dying because the air was full of asbestos when the buildings were imploded. But he lost his own battle to cancer. Christina Whitman first released that the air was not breathable, but then the Bush-Cheney administration told her to retract it. She did. Valentin says he worked roughly 200 hours at Ground Zero wearing only a bandana around his face because U.S. officials said the air was safe. I offered my graphic services and did their PR and business collateral, including t-shirts, of which I'm sure Corey still has hundreds. Do him a favor and buy a couple off him. I met my 26-year-old niece, Rissa, for the first time. I had not been back home in 23 years and was surprised to see that she knew all about the government shenanigans. She met her cousin Mason for the first time. Okay, all that. How about the big hit? Dylan Avery and I conceptually sketched out the fourth version of Loose Change, an American coup. I even got to talk on the phone with Daniel Sinjata from HBO's Rescue Me. September 11th was not just a terrible tragedy that took the lives of thousands of innocent people. It was a violent and aggressive seizure of power and a transformation of both foreign and domestic policy. It was an American coup. We saw the towers for the ashes like in February 2008, I lost my job in advertising. I was an art director who worked for a company whose main client was GM. General Motors got bailed out and they took the money and went overseas. We lost a $258 million account and I lost my job. In 2009, after 35 years of work, I took my unemployment insurance and started pounding the payment. It was like walking the pavement of a ghost town nothing. Dr. Paul was right again. He said this would happen. Hell, the founding father said this would happen. I stepped out of politics, deflated, annoyed, and ticked off. In 2011, my son Mason turned four, and instead of preschool, we opted for the great American pastime, baseball. Seems that Mason has a knack for crushing the ball. He has amazing hand-eye coordination, and at four years of age, he defeated the five, six, and seven-year-olds he played against. I was a very proud papa. I never knew a tougher kid. In this clip, I hit Mason in the leg, accidentally, with a pretty good fastball. Watch his reaction in slow motion. Mason and I put this clip together, and boy, did we laugh. Makes it like a champ. Did that hurt? A In this clip, Mason throws both right and left-handed. Amazing, to say the least. Good throw, dude. Here, catch. Oh, that was a big swing. Oh, yeah, run, 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 run. Here, throw me the ball, Mace. Throw it to me. Oh, good throw. Left. In 2012, Mason turns five years of age, and baseball resumes. At the same time, the Republican debates commence once again, and my hero, the greatest statesman of our generation, is practiced, poised, and ready for the onslaught that we all know is coming. It's very disturbing, because sometimes they're not based on facts, and we suffer the consequences. You know, sometimes it reminds me of this uh, idea of getting corporations out of running campaigns, but what about the corporations that run the media? I mean, they're always in charge. And I, I 
think I think our responsibility uh, is it's sorting facts and fiction. The people have to sort this out. But I think setting standards are very important, and I'm very proud that my wife of 54 years is with me tonight. Well, most of the things the federal government could do to get us back to work is get out of the way. I'd like to donate. <laughs> However, this time, they ignore him I'd even like more. When he does get one or two questions, it's as if a blinding light of truth blasts the others. The government out of the way, we have to recognize why we have unemployment, and it comes because we have a deeply flawed financial system that causes financial bubbles, the bubbles burst, and you have the unemployment. Now, the most important thing to get over that hump that was created artificially by bad economic policies is to allow the correction to occur. You have to get rid of the excessive debt, you have to get rid of the malinvestment. And you don't do that by buying the debt off, off the people who, who were benefiting from it. So we, the people, shouldn't be stuck with, stuck with these debts on these mortgage derivatives and all. We need to get that behind us, which means the government shouldn't be doing any bailout. So most of the things to improve the environment is getting the government out of the way and enforce contract laws and enforce bankruptcy laws. I think where the real problem is, is uh, we can create a healthy economic environment if we did the right things. But where the veterans really deserve help, both as a physician and as a congressman, is the people who come back and aren't doing well health-wise. They need a lot more help. We have an epidemic now of suicide of our military coming back. So they need a lot of medical help. And uh, I think they come up short change. They came up short change after Vietnam War. Persian Gulf War, and even now, they don't get care from the Veterans Administration. On the floor. Do you trust these men to repeal uh, Obamacare? Thank you. <laughs> I thought you were, I thought maybe you were prejudiced against doctors and a doctor that practiced medicine in the military or something. <laughs> Rick Perry dropping in and Michelle Bachman and Ron Paul dominating the Ames straw poll. We got ourselves a race. We have a top tier. It is Mitt Romney, Rick Perry, and Michelle Bachman. We have a new top tier, and it's Perry, Mitt Romney, and Bachman. There's now a top tier in this race, at least for now, of Romney, Perry, and Bachman. I mean, I think that's fair to say. Really fair to say? You're not forgetting, I don't know, anyone, say, an ideologically consistent 12-term congressman who came within less than 200 votes of winning the straw poll? Isn't anyone going to give that gentleman a little love? There's a top tier now of, of, of Bachman and Perry and Romney, and, you know, we haven't mentioned, and we should... Thank you! <laughs> we haven't mentioned, and we should, Rick Santorum, who did really surprisingly well for the amount of money and resources he had. Rick Santorum? He didn't get half of what Ron Paul got. He lost to the guy who lost so bad he dropped out of the race. <laughs> Santorum? We're looking at Mitt Romney, who continues to be the front runner, but we have Rick Perry as well, and now Michelle Bachman. Let's not count out John Huntsman, though. What? <laughs> John Huntsman? Huntsman got 69 votes. Uh, Ron Paul, you're the most untalked about contender today. <laughs> After this weekend, I can never remember. You should be getting as many headlines as Michelle Bartman. You nearly beat her, and yet, oddly, the media seem completely obsessed with her and not obsessed with you. Why is that? Uh, I am gaining recognition in the campaign, and it's a threat to a lot of people. It's a threat to the military industrial complex. It's a threat to the bankers, the big corporations who get all the benefit. It's a threat to the people who preach that we have to be in the world and uh, be in all these countries. So I think it's big banks, big money, big corporations, and, and the people- They marginalize him. Mongers. And that's when I get really mad. I start taking every penny I have and buy Ron Paul signs and t-shirts and plant signs everywhere. I volunteer my graphic art services to do billboards and newspaper ads for Ron Paul Super PAC. I do a sign bomb for Ron Paul. <laughs> I know, man.
Voting for me? Yeah, who are you voting for? I'm totally voting for Ron Paul. Awesome. So. Yay! How are you guys doing? This is overwhelming. The crowds are crazy. I know. We didn't lie, guys. <laughs> In June 2012, as I went to vote for Ron Paul at the voting booth, my girlfriend Heather and I were told that we could not wear any Ron Paul gear as it would be deemed electioneering. It's, it's, here it's, it's, it's really dumb, but the thing is for Man, this is what we're voting against. If somebody's you know? in here that hasn't made up their mind. I laugh about that to this day. My beautiful girlfriend just takes off the Ron Paul shirt, much to the chagrin of the volunteer workers. <laughs> here we go. Please don't strip, thank you. Oh, you up here. I'm sorry, I just thought you would just project it psychically. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm gonna go over here so you don't cheat on the test. Awesome. Hmm, who am I voting for president? Rick and Torm Psych. Here in California, you have to be registered to vote for the party you were voting for. However, no one wanted to register, and I was at a loss. That's when we hear that Dr. Ron Paul will be speaking in the Bay Area. Me, Mason, and Heather pile in the car to go to UC Berkeley to hear Dr. Paul speak. Amazingly, we're on the news that night. Camera, so I was very quiet and calm, didn't shake, and jumped around like I wanted to. Well, Raj, Ron Paul says he's campaigning on college campuses because he has lots of support from students. But tonight here at UC Berkeley, people of all ages from all over the Bay Area came to hear him speak. There was so much interest in the event, it had to be moved outside to accommodate the crowd. A crowd of hundreds welcomes Republican presidential hopeful Ron Paul to the famously liberal UC Berkeley campus. Speaking on the steps of the library, Paul laid out issues he plans to address. Too many wars, too many attacks on our liberty, too much death, too much mischief, too much benefits for the special interest, and, and too many bailouts. Heather Retzinger came from Lafayette to hear her candidate. I was a Democrat, but this guy got me under on Paul, and now I'm a Republican. My family is just a gap. Gretzinger says Paul's foreign policy and budget strategy makes sense to her. Bringing all of our troops home and the reserve, um, you know, just staying out of people's business. Her boyfriend, Patrick Holman, is a campaign volunteer. Balance the budget, cut a trillion dollars. Obviously, we can't afford anything. You know, people always say, oh, he wants to cut education. No, he wants to cut the money out from the bureaucrats. Many supporters say Paul won't win the Republican nomination, but that won't change their vote. We're going to write him in. That's it, Ron Paul. Holman says Paul supporters aren't giving up on his ideas, and it doesn't sound like the candidate is giving up. In a one-on-one -on -one interview, Paul tells NBC Bay Area News he may take his campaign all the way to the Republican convention. It would be unusual, of course, because you see they, yeah, and, and I'm sure those who are in charge or ahead, they don't want that to happen, but that's the way the process could work. Paul supporters here in the Bay Area will have a chance to vote for their candidate in California's Republican primary in June. In the news clip, they say that a couple hundred people gather, but that was not the case. 5,000 students of all ethnicities show up. California is home to the most diverse groups in the union. People from many different nations represent the student population. Now I'm really pumped and everyone thinks Mason is just the coolest kid. That's when it hits me. Mason. I should get Mason to help me register people to vote. My name is Mason. I vote for Grandpa. The following day, Mason, Brett, and I travel to Diablo Valley College, one of the top 10 secondary colleges in the nation. Heather suggests we just start registering people to vote. So we go get forms from the post office to register people to vote Republican for Ron Paul. We all know that Mitt Romney is the fall guy for Obama. We're not impressed. Where I could only register one person the previous day, Mason registers an unprecedented 15 people in one day.
Are you registered Republican? Libertarian. Libertarian? Um, well, to vote for Ron Paul, are you going to vote for... Uh, well, you have to be registered Republican to vote for Ron Paul really? because it's a closed primary in oh, yeah, California. Okay. All right. Are you late for class? Uh, no, I'm not. Got five you days, man. It takes all two it. minutes to fill it out. Yeah, all right. And plus, you're going to be on an awesome YouTube video. You're going to be so, famous. Awesome. Yeah, and this is what liberty is all about. I know a lot of libertarians. Good job, Mace. You're missing people. I can. What are you going to do? You going to get that person to help you? You should vote, huh? Good job, buddy. Wait I can't register. It is, but it's a closed primary in California. He even enlists the help of another five-year-old there with his mother who had a table to help people start their own businesses. The boy tells Mason that he's scared to do it. And Mason says, don't worry, Good you'll be job. with me. You did it. Mason just talked to his kid into help on him. That's so amazing. Signed and dated. Do you know how easy your signature is? I think I can forge it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 16. Uh, uh, awesome, thank you. You ran out? At one point during the day, Mason hands Ron Paul literature to a group of Marines trying to enlist college kids into the Corps. In California, the military must be allowed to proselytize students on campus or the campus loses its federal funding. All in all, it was a very successful day to register people to vote. Coming to the Ron Paul Rally. Ron Paul is speaking at UC Davis. Uh. We make the two-hour drive with high hopes. The crowd is massive. <laughs> May 2nd. This is history in the making. Look at all these people. Oh my goodness. This is amazing. Hurry up, you guys. Excuse me. People are running for freedom, running to catch up and see Ron Paul. It's amazing. I know. Right here, by this tree. stand but 30 yards from my hero, Dr. Paul. I'm freaking out. I can't believe I'm this close to him. Again, the media says there's only a couple hundred people. However, the sea of students is too massive to count. I'm told close to 7,000 people show up. Others estimate 10,000. I was there. Beautiful campus, but you know what else I noticed? 
Que boa paz, irmãos, não banhal. It is a very sad day for me to realize that Romney, no surprise there, gets the Republican nomination. Let me see if I can get this right. The guy that lost to McCain last time, who lost to Obama last time, who lost to Ron Paul last time, is now the candidate for the GOP? Priceless. Thank you. I mean, what's going on here? The goal of a free society. But now, I don't care anymore. I know that Dr. Paul was the true candidate, the one with the message of freedom and liberty. All I ever wanted was to see Dr. Paul debate Barack Hussein Obama. It would have been epic. Maybe that's the real reason they didn't want him for the Republican candidate. It would have been very embarrassing to see Dr. Paul destroy the honorary constitutional professor. Because the phenomenon of blowback is not understood or denied, our foreign policy is destined to keep us involved in many wars that we have no business being in. National bankruptcy and a greater threat to Dr. Paul was the one that woke me up from my apathy, the one that taught me the true meaning of a world without tyranny and oppression, the one that gave me hope, real hope, for my son and for everyone who is concerned for the future of their children and the future of this country. That we should take our marching orders from Al Qaeda. If they want us off the Arabian Peninsula, we should leave. <laughs> no. I'm saying, I'm saying we should take our marching orders from our constitution. We should not. So do I, Dr. Paul. So do I. We should not go to war without a declaration. We should not go to war. Mason will be six on the 24th of January, 2013, two days away as I write this sentence. I have taught my son well and will continue to do so. I look back on that time with a lump in my throat. I will never forget the man that awakened a generation to the evils of a government out of control. We need not, as my friend Dylan and I like to say, watch history repeat itself. This is my story of the revolution of Dr. Ron Paul congressman and three-time presidential candidate of the Republic of the United States. All of our stories together tell the tale of the final days of our great experiment of freedom. For that reason, I think that the lender of last is the end game upon us? Do anything, take risks, the, the handwriting is on the wall. So it's time we ended the charade before the future of my son and the future of all of our children is destroyed. <laughs> it's time we all live and be responsible for our own lives as Dr. Paul so poignantly taught us. It's time we all stood together to take the power back. So Mason, what are we going to do? I'm going to go on my bike. Are we going to take the power back? Yes, take the power back. Now you have to go take the power back. Okay. Take the power back. That's what I'm talking about. High five.